You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Live from the Judiciary's Teletraining Studio in Washington, D.C., the Federal Judicial Center presents Negotiation and Effective Court Administration, a professional development program for staff of the U.S. Courts. Welcome. I'm Michael Siegel, and I'll be your instructor today. I'm delighted to be presenting from the newly renovated teletraining studio uh, in Washington. I'm told that this is the first live broadcast out of this studio this millennium. So I'm very excited to uh, be part of that and uh, welcome you. I think there are five sites out there. We'll be calling on you very soon and uh, going through a, a little exercise uh, very early in the program. But I want to say that uh, I'm here to, to help you think and learn about negotiating. Negotiating, And negotiating is a very important skill. Uh, it's important for various reasons. First of all, it's important because uh, when we can creatively solve conflicts, we can extend our resources, we can extend our energy, we can make our agencies and organizations more effective, and we can do better work. So it's as simple as that. Organizations that find creative ways to solve their conflicts, to solve their disagreements, uh, are really able to perform better. It's been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is the case. Secondly, uh, we uh, are in an era when the old notion of command and control, that managers would get things done by barking out orders, uh, that era really is coming to an end with the diffusion of information, with people being feeling more empowered because of their knowledge, uh, it's more a matter of persuading people to go along with organizational goals and not so much ordering them. The, the command and control is really uh, falling by the wayside in many ways, and negotiation skills are a very good replacement for command and control, and we'll talk about that as a leadership tool and as a management tool for effective administration in the courts. Now, the good news is that um, these skills can be learned by anybody. They are not the province of a chosen f few. Uh, you don't have to be Henry Kissinger. Uh, you can find your own negotiating style. You can find your own strengths, your own resources. We will guide you with some principles, but the way you actually implement those principles, as you'll have a chance to do in part two of this program, that's going to depend on your unique blend of strengths. And uh, you will find that uh, you will be a different style negotiator than the person sitting next to you. And speaking of the person sitting next to you, uh, we're going to start you off with a little exercise with that person. And we're going to call that person your neighbor for these purposes. And uh, so we're going to ask you to turn to the person sitting directly next to you. Uh, and if it's an odd number, you can do a group of three. And we want you to talk to each other about what you find easy about negotiating, whether you're negotiating uh, in a business or an organization or a government agency or a community organization, or whether you're negotiating in a more personal situation, what's easy about the process? And then secondly, what's challenging about negotiation? Uh, we all know that uh, this is not a simple thing, although uh, many people think it's a simple thing. It, it really is a complex process involving a lot of different skills and human emotions and so forth. And we're going to try to uh, shed some light on what these are. So. What I want you to do, though, is tell us, tell me what uh, you're thinking about as easy and challenging, and I'll make some notes. I'm going to give you about four minutes to have this discussion, and I'm going to then go out to the sites. I think I'll start on the West Coast. We'll go out to the Bankruptcy Court in California, and then we'll come eastward and go to Maryland, and then we'll go to the middle of the country and go to Chicago. We're going to call on you uh, all the sites before the day is over, because there are only five of you, so you, there's no chance to hide in this course. And uh, we'll be very interested in your comments, again, about what's easy and what's challenging in negotiating. See you in about four minutes.
All right, I hope you've had a chance to have a good discussion with your neighbor. I know we'll get some rich ideas as we begin to go to the sites and to uh, ask you for your feedback on Push to Talk. Let me also uh, offer you the fax number in case you have problems with the Push to Talk at 1-800-488-0397. That would be another way to communicate with us in case you are having problems uh, with the Push to Talk or if somebody in the group just feels more comfortable sending in a question that way, that's fine. Okay, um, let's now go out to uh, California, uh, Los Angeles, and I believe we have Harriet Gordon out there. Harriet, how are you? I'm fine. Good. How's the weather? Believe it or not, it's raining. We never get rain in Southern California. Actually, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Makes us feel a little less bad. Actually, we're having a fairly nice day in Washington, but it's been very cold. Harriet, what did you or your group come up with as far as uh, an idea about something that's easy when you're negotiating? Um, uh, hold on, Lenore wants to speak. Okay. Our group decided that knowing the subject matter. Okay. Knowing the subject matter uh, makes it a lot uh, easier and in fact, uh, I would like to build on that comment because I think it's a very important one. Uh, sometimes when you have negotiations between, for example, highly technical automation people and not so highly technical court staff, the highly technical people has the, ha the highly technical person has the edge and it, it creates somewhat of an inequality. So in, uh, in an effort to equalize things, it's very helpful if people with more knowledge can share that knowledge and put people on an equal footing and then have a negotiation. You're absolutely right. It makes it much easier uh, when you know the subject matter. So thank you for that idea, Lenore. Uh, is there another idea there before we move eastward uh, on something that's easy in negotiating? Anything else? In okay, this is uh, Harriet. and. Um it's uh, finding out what the other person wants, asking questions. Okay. Okay. Finding what the other person wants um, is easy. Uh, or when you can do that, it definitely does uh, make the negotiation easier uh, because then you have it out on the table and uh, that's, that becomes a, something that's easier to move from. One of the problems is that some people are actually reluctant to tell you what they want or are shy about telling you what they really want, trying to disguise it, for example, with something else. And when that happens, as you correctly uh, point out, I'm, I'm in intuiting something from what you're saying, it becomes more difficult when you kind of have to, you know, struggle with what the person really wants or is motivated by. So it's much easier when people are upfront about it, even if it seems direct, or even if in some cases it seems even aggressive. It's probably better and more effective in negotiating than to have to search and constantly probe for what the person really wants. Thank you for those ideas. I'm going to move out now to Maryland. Uh, Rebecca Tate, are you out there? I'm here, but I'm not going to be the spokesperson for this question. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Diane Poling. Okay, let's still stay on the easy, and then we'll move over to the challenging. Diane, what do you have for us? We talked about some of the same things, um, determining the boundaries of, of what the parties involved need or what they want. Okay. This is a uh, good point and it's a slightly different point and that is um, exactly what are we negotiating? Is this one issue or is this a multiple uh, issue uh, situation? Uh, do we want to take it one step at a time? Do we want to try to disentangle some of the issues from each other because they're all, all in one package? It's almost impossible to get through them all. Uh, maybe we can do them one by one. Maybe we can find the easier one first and build some momentum that way. So uh, when we uh, determine boundaries, and, and you might even determine at your first negotiation that all you're going to do is develop a process for how you're going to uh, negotiate. Uh, and so it's a very good idea to be clear about boundaries, and I think that does make things easier. Do you have one more idea on something that's easy? I guess related to that was uh, people skills. Yes, uh, that's a very good point. Um, 
whoever, uh, I forgot the name of the person who was making it in Maryland. Uh, who was the person in Maryland? Right now it's Diane. Diane, thank you for that point. Uh, I'll build on that point also to talk a little bit about the important work being done right now in the area of emotional intelligence and how uh, research by uh, Daniel Goleman, G-O-L-E-M-A-N, and others, uh, researchers are finding that people with emotional intelligence uh, are more often are often more effective in organizations than people with a lot of intellectual intelligence but who aren't good people don't have good people skills as you point out so having good sk uh, people skills knowing uh, what motivates people knowing what angers people being able to read people there's a book called how to read a person like a book uh, if you have good skills in those areas that does make you I think a more effective negotiator and uh, that's uh, thank you for that point. Uh, I'm going to now move to Chicago. Uh, is Martha Veal with us? Uh, unfortunate, unfortunately not. So, well, somebody else is there. Who, who is speaking, please? My name is Stan Holloway. Stan, uh, do you have any ideas or anybody in the room about uh, something that makes negotiation more challenging? One thing that we discussed was having an open mind during the dialogue. Okay, so keeping an open mind uh, is uh, actually a challenge, and some people, as you uh, probably know, have a hard time with that. Their mind is made up very quickly, and uh, they can't really hear, they can't even hear ideas that are different from their own, or they're so busy rehearsing uh, in their own mind the speech they're going to give when the other person is finished speaking that they haven't even heard what the other person has to say. So being an open-minded, truly listening to what the other side is saying uh, is a challenge. It's a very difficult thing to do and uh, not many people actually do it very well. When you can do it very well, you can become actually a very powerful negotiator because it helps you gain insight into the interests and needs and motivations of the other side and therefore you're able to offer more creative ideas, I think. Uh, let's uh, see if you have one more idea on challenges in Chicago. Uh, one of the things that we discussed was a uh, lack of people skills. Right. So it's a sort of a corollary uh, with what they said as a strength. Uh, the existence of people skills, clearly, again, the lack of people skills is something that um, is, uh, it does make it more challenging. And again, it is why it is not, you know, you might think anybody, I said earlier that we can all learn to be negotiators, and that's true, but I will not say that it's something that's easy because it does take refining people skills, listening skills, feedback skills, summarizing skills, and many other skills that are not that easy and that we don't really learn in school, and uh, the absence of those is really noticeable uh, in a negotiation. I'm going to go to one more site and see uh, if uh, they have anything to add, either on the easy side of the ledger or on the challenging side. And let me see if uh, Rhode Island, is Jennifer Diaz available? Hi, we're here. Excellent. Jennifer, do you have anything to add, either in the column of easy or challenging? Sometimes it's challenging just to stay calm in the whole situation of negotiating. That's really an excellent point. And um, uh, that's particularly challenging when the other party does things to uh, break your calm. And for example, I've seen people seat people directly in the sunlight when they're negotiating. In other words, seating them at a place at a seat where the sun is shining directly in their eyes. It's hard to stay calm physically, uh, physiologically in that situation. I've seen people blow smoke in other people's face uh, during a negotiation. These things uh, obviously make it hard to stay calm, and there's also a whole host of other uh, things that people do to, to challenge you uh, to stay calm. But it's very important to stay calm because you probably do better thinking when you're calm. And uh, yeah, that is a very important point. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, did you have any others there at the site, any other either easy or challenging in Rhode Island? We're going to just then go to Kentucky, and then we'll uh, summarize. Uh, any, anything else in, uh, uh, from uh, Rhode Island? Uh, we do. Staying on point, 
Good. During the negotiations? Yes. It's important and it is challenging to stay on point because, uh, again, there are many distractions. There are people who will take you off point. There are people who will try to change the agenda. Uh, there are people who, for various reasons, are engaged in dilatory tactics and uh, will try to get you off point, and uh, that's uh, very troubling. Also, uh, frankly, when we become engaged in uh, people in personal attacks or in yelling and screaming at each other, that also tends to take us off point. Uh, it's hard to stay focused on the issue when you're really getting emotional and excited about things that are going to probably take you away from the major point. So that's a really uh, good insight. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's now move finally to Kentucky. And uh, if I can see if um, uh, Grace Dupre, are you there? Yes, we are. Hi. Hi. Do you have anything to add either on the easy or challenging side? Yes, um, on the easy side, we thought that sometimes once you start communicating, you discover that the sides are not as far apart as you thought, and it turns out to become easier. Good. So in the course of the negotiations, uh, you will discover uh, that there are common interests. And I'm going to give you an example about that later on, a little later today, in fact, uh, in a baseball negotiation. <clears throat> between uh, Baltimore Orioles player Carl, Cal Ripken and the team where through the course of negotiating and one of the things they had to do in that case was change the venue. They had to move the negotiation out of downtown Baltimore and into a uh, more scenic, I, I don't mean to say that downtown Baltimore is not scenic, parts of it are very scenic, but to a very rural, uh, beautiful, uh, with clear blue skies and chirping birds uh, well they found when they moved the venue and they got the negotiation rolling, they were able to find common interests. So that's, uh, that does uh, make things flow a little better. Let's take one more idea there from Kentucky, uh, again, on either side of the ledger. Um, for a challenge, we thought um, that often in negotiations you end up with kind of a, a bully who's not going to give an inch on the other side, and it's really hard to work around them. Yeah. I'm, I'm calling this the bully syndrome. And uh, there are people who uh, are very difficult to negotiate with. It's, it goes back, in a sense, uh, in part at least, to the point made earlier about not being open-minded. Uh, there may be other things. Some people use this as a tactic or a technique uh, to uh, you know, get what they want and so forth. And that is a challenge. Uh, there are ways to deal with it, which hopefully we will be able to talk about as we go through, uh, through the curriculum. Well, this is really a, an outstanding list of both uh, things that make it easier and things that are challenging. What we're going to uh, do is try to make the whole process a little easier for you by giving you uh, somewhat of a system uh, or a framework to use when you're negotiating. So let's take a look now at what our course objectives are. And what we're going to hope to do with you today is, uh, and by the way, you have copies of these slides in your handouts, which I hope you all have. Uh, we now uh, are talking about developing what we call a systematic approach to negotiations. Now, what do I mean by a systematic approach? Uh, you see those four words, standoff, diagnosis, negotiations, and action. Uh, our tendency uh, as human beings and as managers and as court staff and even as judges, uh, is that we tend to go directly from a standoff to an action. Now let me illustrate what I mean by this point uh, through an example with this uh, orange here. You see this nice fresh orange. I hope you're getting hungry because I am by looking at it. Um, imagine uh, this orange. Uh, two kids are fighting over this orange. They're both screaming and crying, I want the orange. So. Um, some very wise person from the federal judiciary, they see there's a standoff there. So some very wise person says, I know the action. I know exactly what action to take to break the standoff, to end the standoff. And what is that action? Let me ask um, Martha or others in Chicago, what's the action that you would take to quickly end this uh, standoff? Either you can cut it in half or uh, take it for yourself. <laughs> 
Okay, if you're hungry, you might take it for yourself. The logical solution that most of us would probably say, I want to get this issue off my desk. I want to deal with it quickly. I'm going to simply take a knife. I would do it, but I have a new suit on. And cut the orange in half and uh, give half to each kid. So we do that. We, we, somebody comes along, we cut it, we give it in half. We give half to each kid, and they're still crying. What's the issue now? Uh, Lexington, Kentucky, what's the issue? Why oh, that's kids? simple. One of them got a bigger half than the other. All right. One issue might be uh, one got a bigger half than the other. Um, At least they perceive that. Or they perceive that. They may get out their uh, rulers or slide rules and start measuring it. Well, the fact of the matter is we never really got to the real issue. One kid wanted the rind of the orange to help his parents cook a pie, and the other kid wanted the contents of the orange to eat it. We never analyzed what the interests of the two parties were in this simple case. We just listened to their positions. Now, we're going to talk a lot about the difference between a position, which is I want the orange, and an interest, which is I want to cook a pie. When you can probe beyond positions to get to interests, you will find that you can develop much more creative solutions to problems. And as we look again at this model, uh, what it requires is that we break our tendency to move quickly to an action. Because our tendency, again, is let's get the problem off our desk, let's get to the next case, whatever it is. But we want you to step back from that quick action and do some diagnosis. We want you to do some diagnosis and then do a negotiation and then take your action. So it will probably slow the process down just a little. And I know that's not always realistic because sometimes you need to solve problems quickly. But I guarantee you, you will get better solutions if you do more diagnosis. And we're going to give you some tools with which to do the diagnosis uh, in order to take better, more creative, and more effective actions. Uh, finally, we're going to uh, describe and, and use, and next time you will actually have a chance to use what we call principled negotiation. Uh, there are many different terms that we could use. Some people use the terminology win-win uh, negotiating. Uh, I like the term principled negotiation because it's based on uh, seven principles, which I'm going to, with your help, elaborate uh, today and go through seven different principles and then have you try to apply them in a case uh, that you'll negotiate next time we meet, uh, which is uh, next Wednesday, I believe. Now, let me ask if there are any questions at this point. Uh, otherwise, we're going to move into the next segment of the program. Michael, this is Kentucky. Um, on your, based upon what you said, I was wondering about the slide. It looked like you were saying we should go from standoff through diagnosis, through negotiations, and then finally to action. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, it may be confusing the way the diagram is presented. Uh, but that is what I meant to suggest. I'm, I'm suggesting that the action be the last step. And whether it's clear enough on this slide or not, that's what I'm intending to say. What I want to really prevent is the tendency to move directly from the standoff to the action. That's really the main point. Does that help? Yes, thanks. OK. Any other questions? OK. Uh, let's then move to take a look at some negotiating systems. Now, when you're negotiating, uh, you have choices to make. You don't have to negotiate the same way each time. And what's involved in a negotiation are two different things, the venue or the method by which you're negotiating and the substance of the negotiation. Now, both are equally important, venue and substance. For example, I tell uh, clerks of court and chief probation officers and other court executives, I say, if every negotiation you have with a judge is in the judge's chambers, you're immediately putting yourself at a disadvantage because the venue in that case is very favorable to the judge. There he or she is in their seat of power, surrounded by all their accoutrements of power, and there you are basically as a supplicant I know it, it, it may not feel that way, but it can have that effect and particularly be perceived that way by the judge. Uh, so I, I suggest 
maybe try for a more neutral territory uh, where the judge isn't quite so enmeshed in all the accoutrements of power and where you can perhaps reduce some of the inequalities that exist in power that are so prevalent in the judiciary. Uh, so venue and content are both important. This is why they argue for uh, a long time in international negotiations, for example, in Middle Eastern negotiations, what city shall we uh, meet in? Shall it be Madrid, or shall it be Oslo, or shall it be Spain? Where shall, where shall we meet is a very important question. We met uh, most recently, they met in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, uh, and that was a very deliberate choice. It was very deliberately chosen not to be in Washington, D.C., because they wanted less interference from the press. They wanted less publicity about the negotiations with Syria between the Syrians and the Israelis that just took place. Recently, they, they moved it up to Shepherdstown, which is a little more uh, removed from the, uh, uh, from the heavy media concentration and so forth. So think about venue and think about substance. Both are equally important. Now, any system, and we're going to give you four different systems of negotiation, any system you use should be judged according to Fisher and Urey in their book, Getting to Yes, which you have listed in your bibliography, should be judged by three criteria. One, does the system produce a wise outcome? Two, is it efficient? And three, does it improve or at least not damage a relationship? Again, three questions you should ask about whatever system you're using. One, does it produce a wise outcome? Two, is it efficient? And three, does that system of negotiation improve or at least not damage a relationship? Now, with those three questions and with the ideas of venue and content in mind, let's take a look, if you will, at a catalog of negotiating systems. I'm going to describe four different ones. And the first one uh, we'll talk about is called hard positional bargaining. Now, in hard positional bargaining, you say yes, I say no. Sounds like a Beatles song, doesn't it? Uh, you say the office with the window, I say the office with the window. You say the Pentium computer, I say the Pentium computer. We put our stakes in the ground, you put your stake here, I put my stake here, and we continue to, deep, to dig our stakes deeper and deeper into the ground, and it becomes less and less likely that either of us will make concessions. Because what's happening is that we're becoming tied more to our ego, and it's becoming a contest of wills, and we're becoming less focused on what is the best idea. In fact, in hard positional bargaining, frequently who's right becomes more important than what's right. I'm not going to give in to her again. How many times have we heard that? By the way, this is why kids are fantastic at positional bargaining, because they have more energy. They don't get tired the way we do. And actually, the outcome of hard positional bargaining frequently is who gets tired first. I can't argue with you anymore. Have your way. I just don't have the energy to continue this. Take, take leave. Take this project away from me. I can't argue with you anymore. So in hard positional bargaining, we are acting, uh, in fact, if you look at Albert Einstein's definition of insanity, he says that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. In hard positional bargaining, in a sense, we are acting insanely because we say, well, maybe if I raise my voice, <laughs> maybe they'll really understand my point. I'm not going to change my point. I'm not going to change my approach, but I'm going to speak a little louder, uh, or I'm going to get mad, or whatever it is. I'm going to get sarcastic. Um, we, we don't really change our approach. We keep going the same way. Now, let me ask, uh, let me go down to uh, uh, California, uh, Harriet's group there in the bankruptcy court. Uh, have you seen, uh, do you recognize this as a familiar style of negotiating? Yes, we do. Do you see any uh, benefits or any disadvantages of this style of negotiating? No benefit. Okay. It's hard to see the benefits because very often 
Again, the outcome is not the best outcome, but it's produced by fatigue or by other things. And I don't think it satisfies those three criteria that Fisher and Urey talked about. Does it produce a wise outcome? Is it efficient? And does it improve a relationship? It may not damage our relationship because we're kind of used to it. In fact, in our personal lives, this happens a lot. But it doesn't improve relationships. Let's take a look now at the second style of negotiating, and that is the game of chicken. It's another style of negotiating. Now let me ask Grace uh, or others in Lexington, do they play the game of chicken out there in Kentucky? Well, I'm not sure about the negotiating game, but the driving game they do. All right. What is the driving game? Tell us about that. You would each be driving down a road headed toward each other, and neither one would move to the side of the road. Exactly. Two uh, cars driving down a highway 70 miles an hour. One person has to leave or you both get killed. Uh, we're in a rowboat. We're going to drill a hole in this. I'm going to drill a hole in the boat until you give me what I want. Or you give me my budget or I'm going to shut down the federal government, which is how our budget was formulated in 1995 when Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton couldn't negotiate an agreement. They played the game of chicken. Now, chicken is a way to negotiate. Uh, you may not have seen the parallel immediately from the driving game, but it is a way to negotiate. It's relying primarily on coercion, on fear, and intimidation and threats. Now, Eisenhower once said, you can rely on fear and coercion and command, uh, et cetera, as a form of leadership, and people will obey you as long as you're in the room. An interesting quotation from Eisenhower. Uh, because you better not turn your back on people if you've negotiated this way. Let me give you an interesting anecdote of a recent experience I witnessed in an airport that uh, illustrated this point about don't t turn your back if you've played chicken. There was a long line of uh, passengers uh, uh, at an airport at a particular gate, and um, uh, uh, an individual, a man, just rushed in front of it and started making all kinds of demands on the ticket agent and started raising his voice and being very rude, very obnoxious, making all kinds of demands on her. And she was really trying her best to calm him down, as you said, to stay calm and to uh, get have an idea of what he really wanted and to help him ultimately a customer service challenge that we sometimes deal with in the courts and he just kept going on ranting and raving and ranting and raving and um, finally she took care of him she mollified him and he left and then he came back started yelling again and he was just out of control and finally she got rid of him she sent him on his way and the guy behind him uh, when he approached her at the ticket stand he said to her uh, Miss, I want to commend you. You've done an outstanding job with this individual. Uh, you really uh, held your own, and you acted very professionally. He was out of control. And she smiled, and she said, uh, don't worry. I got him back. He said, well, what do you mean? He, she said, well, he's going to Kansas City, but his bags are going to Tokyo. So you see, uh, <laughs> using fear and intimidation uh, has a cost. There's a cost to pay. I'm not recommending anybody uh, use that as a form of customer service, but I thought it was a cute way to make the point about chicken. Now, nobody likes to be threatened. We don't do our best work when we're threatened, and yet people continue to use that as a form of negotiation. Let me go now to um, uh, let me go to uh, Marilyn, Rebecca, or others. Uh, what about chicken? Is this? Uh, what do you think about using this as a negotiating strategy? I personally don't think it's a very good idea. Um, people have long memories, and uh, they'll wait for any opportunity to get you back. That's a very good point. People do have long memories, and they will seek a way to get back. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of risky proposition. Uh, anything else that comes to mind from any of the sites about the game of chicken? It seems to focus more on the individuals and not the issue at hand. Very good point. Uh, who is speaking, please? This is Mark Sammons from uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, Mark. That's a very good observation, Mark. It's focused more on the individuals and how you can exert pressure on an individual 
and not really on the purpose that you're serving with this particular task or the goals of the organization. That's a, that's a very perceptive comment, and uh, I agree with it. Now, let me just say, there may be times when you have to use chicken. Let me give you a quick example of a personal experience where I had to use chicken. Um, I was once uh, at a job where I was being given a fairly difficult time on the question of religious leave. A boss was trying to make it hard for me to take religious leave for a holiday. And I thought that that was wrong, and I checked, and of course uh, many of the laws were quite clear that uh, employers were expected to grant this leave to employees. And of course there was a little stipulation that uh, always says at the discretion of the supervisor. So if a supervisor wants to give somebody a hard time, they probably have an out. But I still didn't like the idea. Um, and so I uh, started getting upset about it. And I was being coached by um, my fellow uh, employees. And they were saying, oh, why don't you negotiate? I was new at this job. They said, why don't you negotiate it, work out a deal, work out a compromise. You know, uh, he's weird. Don't worry about it. And I said, well, I said, I'll tell you something. I would be tempted to do this if it weren't so important to me, uh, but I can't do that. I'm sorry, not in this case. So I uh, called him. Uh, I went into his office, and I said, um, I play chicken. I said, I'll tell you what. You deny me my religious leave, and I'm going to take you to court. And I smiled. I was playing chicken. And guess what happened? What happened was I got my religious leave, and I got an apology from his boss. So the point is, uh, there are times when you may have to play chicken. It's not something you should just abandon. There may be people who won't understand anything else. Kofi Annan said about negotiating with Saddam Hussein, he said diplomacy is great, but diplomacy backed by force in this case is even better. Uh, and that's uh, a reality of life, that there are some people who you're going to need more than moral suasion alone uh, to influence them and to negotiate with them, in a sense. Okay, let's move now to our third uh, form of negotiating, a form very popular in Washington, D.C., and that is the uh, negotiating system that I call favors and ledgers. Favors and ledgers. What do you think that means? Uh, let's go to uh, Chicago, Martha, uh, Via, or others in Chicago. What do you think I mean by favors and ledgers? This is Linda Rudolph in Chicago. Uh, to me, I think it means that we'll work this thing out by doing favors for each other, or I'll do something for you, but I'm going to keep track of those favors, and eventually I'm going to call them in. Excellent. Excellent. I couldn't say it any better. It's exactly the way it is. It's the game that's played, for example, in Capitol Hill. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You vote for me on this bill, I'll vote for you on another bill. If I'm from New York City and I care a lot about the uh, subway, the mass transit operating subsidies, and you're from Georgia and you don't really care very much about the New York subway, but you do care about peanuts, I'll vote for you on the mass transit, you vote for me on peanuts, and we work out these deals and arrangements. We do favors for each other. I'll do this project for you this time because I know you really don't want to do it. Uh, you'll have to do something for me in the future. But as you correctly point out, we are keeping score. And if the person doesn't come through, as somebody said earlier, we have long memories. So uh, while this is a very powerful form of negotiation, and by the way, the reason it's so powerful, the reason favors is so powerful to negotiate, is that the human dynamic of reciprocity is very powerful. A uh, fascinating study on this by Cialdini. You have a book uh, listed in your bibliography called Influence by a social psychologist named Cialdini who studied the way people influence each other. And one of the ways is through reciprocity. And he did a fascinating study of the Hare Krishna. They used to go to people in airports and ask for money. And they got absolutely no money, nothing, very, very little money. They then came on the idea, let's give people a flower first and then ask them for money. Guess what happened? their uh, contributions went up exponentially. So reciprocity is an extremely important human dynamic. It undergirds the power of favors and ledgers, and it makes it very human, a very human tendency. But as you've correctly pointed out, it may not produce the best outcomes. Because 
in a sense, if the outcome of hard positional bargaining is who gets tired first, the outcome of favors and ledgers may be whose turn is it? Whose turn is it? Who's, who owes who a favor? And that's not necessarily getting at your best answer. It's getting at who needs to do a favor for whom. Now let me go back to uh, Los Angeles. Harriet or others uh, there, uh, have any comments about favors and ledgers? Michael, I think in the long run, you, you lose credibility. Okay, why is that? That's an interesting point. Well, you get the uh, perception that you, your opinions and, and decisions are for sale. Very good point. Very good point. You give out the impression that your opinions and decisions are for sale to the highest bidder, uh, and that is uh, a, a very, very, uh, yeah, that's, not an, uh, that's not a reputation you necessarily want. That doesn't necessarily help your credibility. That's a very, very good comment. Uh, the other fact of the matter is some people have more to give out than others. Uh, if you're a clerk of court, you may have more favors to give out than if you're somebody else uh, lower in the hierarchy and so forth. So uh, we want to be careful about that uh, and uh, consider using it, uh, maybe when we have to, but look at another form uh, that I'm going to call principled negotiation. That'll be our last form of negotiation, and we'll come back to that after we... Uh, take a look at a short video clip. Now what I'm going to do, let me show, uh, set up, we're going to take a look now at a short vignette of a negotiation that's not going particularly well. It's a negotiation that occurs in the private sector between a, uh, turns out, a dentist and a computer uh, expert who are in a business together. Perhaps an unlikely combination. Nonetheless, there they are in a business together and they're having a pretty rough time uh, solving a conflict, and I'm going to show you a short vignette of this, about a seven-minute vignette, and I want you to, to look for what systems of negotiation are being used, uh, because it's primarily a negative example, but it'll set us up to look at the other side uh, immediately thereafter. So your assignment in looking at this video clip is, what styles, what negotiation systems that we just described, hard positional bargaining, chicken, etc. Do you see it work in the Hacker Star negotiation? So what are we doing here? What are we doing now in this meeting right now today? What do you think we're trying to accomplish? What do you think? Well, all, I mean, all I feel you're trying to accomplish is to vent on me personally. And I think we should deal with the issues and the practicality. Like, where is Power Screen right now? Power Screen is finished. It's a good program. Sorry, but you were wrong. Sorry, other people think it's great. But the fact is that you've gone out, you've negotiated with these people, you've got a deal. You made a deal behind my back. No, you're wrong. And I feel ripped off. You're up. wrong. It's not just the money, it's not just that. It's personal trust. I trusted you. I object yet. to the behind, behind your back scenario because I showed it to you, I offered it to you on several occasions and you rejected it outright, insultingly. And I didn't go out and in, in search of a buyer for this. It fell into my lap the same way you fell into my lap because I was at a... But then you made a deal. Then you negotiated I didn't make a deal. these No, people. I didn't make a deal. I have... You've taken that product away from the company. I feel that the company, this company owns the product. When did the company uh, decide to do the, uh, the product? When did the company when okay you, it? When did it, when did it go into to work? You, according to you, since you are the company, you went out and did it. I did it at night. And I... You... I did it at you night. You do lots of things at night for the company and on weekends. I'm not, listen, if you go out fishing, Alan, I'm not saying that if you catch a fish, it belongs to the company. But what I am saying, the way you operate, if you get an idea in the middle of the night on port -a word or resource I, control or marketing. I owe 50% of it to a, you? Yeah, because it's our product. The fact is, it's our product. 
I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way. I don't see how you see it that way. It's not our product, and how dare you even say it's our product when you remember distinctly saying, no, it's a terrible product six times to me. I and even when it was finished, and obviously a grand product, I you said, said it's it too was esoteric. a bad product. I said it was too esoteric. I didn't think it was too esoteric. I didn't think it was marketable. I didn't think it was, uh, uh, you said you put in thousands of hours. At the time, I didn't feel that that was the product in which to invest thousands of hours of development time. You've, you've got to... You did it anyway. Yes, I did it anyway, and I'm glad I did it, and, you, and, um, and I'm glad I did it. You know, I think that you're wrong, both technically about this new product and wrong in your whole mentality towards this market. You know, I know you get upset when I call you a dentist. Right, but you have a dentist mentality, right? Your wife said that when she split on you, right? And it's a sh cheap shot, but you know, today- You're doing to me exactly, except more emotionally and more painfully. Because when, when, when I rejected power screen, I didn't insult you personally, which is what you're doing now. You're rejecting my ideas. And then you're saying, okay, you never contributed. You feel as if the company is entirely you. And that all I did. You show up once in. a month yeah. and wring your hands and, and naysay and complain and kvetch and just generally act like a complete wet blanket. And, um, and I'm expected to, to think that you're contributing to this company? I put you're a, an amateur. I put, yes, I'm an amateur. And that's what you've been telling me now for six years. And I've had it. I think you're a child. You, so what? You've been Let's an amateur. Let's talk business. Uh, you've got a covenant in the contract that you cannot compete with HackerStar. Do you think you're going to be able to take that contract and make it stand up in some kind of court? Sure. No, no, no. I mean, it's very, very specific. It's not that vague read a at sentence, all. Read, read a sentence that that's clear to me. Okay, I will. I brought it with me. I see you did. I'm sure you carry it around with you. Okay. The company will employ the manager as a general manager for a period of eight years. First of all, there's eight years mentioned. Okay. Get well, the business. manager is employed here under, and for one year after termination of such employment, the manager will Are not engage in competition. Are you going to read the whole thing to me? Cut to the part that I'm reading that. Will not engage in competition with the company, either directly or indirectly, in any manner or capacity, as advisor, principal, agent, partner, officer, director, blah, 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 of any association or otherwise in any phase of the business of designing, writing, testing, selling, or producing microcomputer software. No problem because on. there's no competition with power screen between Porter Word no, and for the writing control. any software. I mean, whether you like it or not, this is the real world. This is what judges and lawyers pay attention to. This is a legal document. Well, go to your people, the judges and lawyers and that ilk, right? And if you're right, right, then good. But you're not going to win. You have to prove that I was negligent, and you're not going to be able no, to do that. No, all I have to prove is that you signed this contract, which you did. Okay, if it's that simple, go ahead. Why are you sweating? Well, because I don't want to lose the company. I see something to gain in here. The other guy who says I'll take Just my ball back. Just do something back. now, quickly. I don't want to talk about this for another six months. Do it now. Dissolve the company. Sue me. Do whatever see, you're going to do. Just it's do it negative. now. It's I just don't want to continue now. like this, Stan. It's all negative. You're Stan. being totally negative. You want to come in and talk about it? No. Okay. Alan, we're going to have to see you in court. I'm looking forward and to it. And that's not your environment. They don't do things the way you like them in court. And you know something? The judge is probably a drudge, too. We usually leave that last line, a line out of the judges' programs. Uh, let me go to, uh, I'm going to go to Providence, Rhode Island, the Jennifer, our colleagues, and ask you what styles of negotiating you saw at work there. Uh, this is Barbara D'Amico from Providence. Hi. At first, I saw the hard positions bargaining, uh -huh. and then I think I saw the chicken. Okay. Uh, threatening to go to court. Okay. 
Good, yeah. I think we see clearly at first uh, di very different perceptions. Yeah, you did it on company time. I didn't do it on company time. Again, with the stakes in the ground going back and forth, not really uh, making any progress or doing any analysis. And it does escalate uh, by the end to chicken. Uh, I'll have to see you in court. It's not your environment. Uh, very good. Uh, let me ask uh, uh, Grace Dupre in Lexington or others, uh, what else did you see in there? Any styles or any points about negotiating? Uh, they certainly didn't remain calm, and they probably um, negated any chance for coming to an agreement because they started getting very personal in their comments. Yes, a lot of personal attacks. Uh, they're doing exactly the opposite of what we advise. There's a little phrase that I use called be hard on the issues and soft on the people. And uh, they are doing exactly the opposite. They're being hard on the people and soft on the issues. And that is not an effective approach uh, to negotiating. Uh, very good. Uh, let me ask in Los Angeles, uh, what observations would you make? And then we're going to go ahead and start the seven principles. Michael, it just seemed like a no-win situation. Do you mean that there doesn't seem to be a solution, or do you mean that the way they're dealing with each other is no-win? I think the way they were dealing with each other, there's no way they can come to an agreement. Yes. They don't have a process that will get to an agreement. You're absolutely right. Uh, first of all, look where they're meeting. They're meeting right there in the computer room. You can tell it's a little dated by the uh, uh, look of the computers. But that's not necessarily the best place to negotiate. The guy's blowing smoke in his face. Uh, the other guy is throwing a pencil up in the air. So there's a lot of things wrong with this process. As you say, this is not going to lead to, uh, to a settlement. It's almost impossible uh, for it to lead that way. Uh, what we're going to find is that what they really need is a mediator uh, because they are not doing very well at talking to each other. And we'll talk a little bit, particularly in part two, about some of the differences between negotiation and mediation. So uh, that's very good. Does anybody else have any additional comments or reflections on the video or uh, questions before we move on to the seven principles of effective negotiation? All right, then. Let's move on to uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to quickly reveal seven uh, principles of effective negotiations that you will see flashing across your screen right now. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take each one of these individually. We'll probably get through most of them today, and we'll save the last few for next time. Uh, I'm going to give some examples, I hope, of these uh, principles in action and what it looks like to use them, and then uh, try to have you apply them to a case study that will uh, get to you for the uh, session next week where you'll act, have a chance to apply these principles in a negotiation between two judges, a bankruptcy judge and a district court judge over the question of courthouse security. I think you'll find that an interesting case and uh, you'll be able to relate to it, I'm sure, very well. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, very important and it is focusing on the interests. Uh, we talked uh, before in that silly example with the orange about the difference between interests and positions. It is interests that brought you to the table. It is your interests, not your position, that you really care about. We want you to, uh, again, be hard on the issues and soft on the people. And we want you to concentrate on what you really want and need. Uh, these, uh, this is what we mean by focusing on the interests. Now, let's take a look, uh, if you will, at this diagram, which shows us uh, that in any issue you face, there is usually the tip of the iceberg is the position. What you hear expressed, I can't get to the office before 9 o'clock, for example, is usually a position. But underneath that position is a clustering of interests. And if you can get to those interests, which does take some work, because as you can see, they're under the surface. People aren't always comfortable revealing them. People may even not be fully aware of what all of them are, but if you can get to them, you can develop much more creative approaches uh, in a negotiation. Now let's take a look at a case study of this from the Middle East. 
Uh, you may remember the Six-Day War between uh, Israel and its Arab neighbors. And the Israelis captured, as you can see on the larger map, the Sinai Peninsula, and they held it. And in 1978, Jimmy Carter, who was the American president at the time, said, I want to try to negotiate a treaty between Israel and Egypt over the Sinai Peninsula, particularly. And so they uh, decided they were going to try to do that and uh, in, the guy, in the role of being a mediator. And they went to both sides. They went to uh, Israel and Egypt. And they said, let us start by exploring your positions. And so they went to Menachem Begin, who at the time was the Israeli prime minister. And they said, Mr. Begin, can you tell us your position? And Begin said, of course, I can tell you my position. I'm going to keep the entire Sinai. That's my position. Thank you for asking. They then went to Sadat, and they said, Sadat, what's your position? Anwar Sadat. And Sadat said, my position is I want the entire Sinai back. That's my position. Thank you for asking. So they had diametrically opposed positions. Now, one of you mentioned before that in, a, in the context of a negotiation, you could come to common interests. Well, the Americans decided, led by Jimmy Carter at the time, they were going to go back and ask each side not what their positions were, because they already knew them, but what their interests were. So they went back to Begin and they said, Begin, we understand your position. You want the whole Sinai. What's your interest? And Begin said, my interest is security. I need this land for the security of my nation. I'm not going to even mention the oil fields. I'll give those back. But I have an air base there that I need for security. The Americans said, oh, you have an air base. Uh, what if we, the Americans, took that air base, moved it to the Negev, and paid for it? And Begin said, I've never thought about that. This is a very interesting idea. Uh, let me think about it. And they said, OK, hold it right there. We're going to go back to Sadat. They went to Sadat, and they said, Sadat, uh, we understand your position. What is your interest? And Sadat said, my interest is sovereignty, sovereignty. I want to see the Egyptian flag fly over this territory, which has historically been taken from us by the British, by the Turks, now by the Israelis. I'm really concerned about sovereignty. Now, the Americans didn't say, well, that's not really a legitimate interest. They said, well, how can we help you meet that interest? They said, what about if we uh, call for a demilitarized zone, pull the Israeli troops back, and let the Egyptian flags fly? And that's basically the deal they got in Camp David. The Camp David Treaty was basically the Israelis gave back part of the Sinai. They got their air base. The Egyptians pulled back their troops. There was a demilitarized zone, and the Egyptians' flag flew. They got a treaty in an area where it's very hard to get peace treaties by moving both parties from their positions to their interests. And sometimes you need a third party to do that. Sometimes you're too embroiled in a direct confrontation to even see your interests. You're too busy arguing again over those stakes in the ground that we talked about earlier. Let's take another look. Let's take a look at another example. Uh, the example from uh, what I mentioned before, Cal Ripken and the Baltimore Orioles. Again, moving from positions to interests. The um, Baltimore Orioles and Cal Ripken uh, a few years ago were separated by several million dollars of salary that, way that they were projecting out for Cal Ripken. And they were negotiating in downtown Baltimore. And finally, the, the mediator or the negotiator, a guy named Schwartz, who, by the way, has written a book called The Power of Nice, interesting title for a baseball uh, negotiator to write. He says, why don't we move this negotiation to my farm uh, up in uh, another part of Maryland where it's uh, a little bit more conducive to a discussion, and they did. And what they found as they talked was that Cal Ripken's interests were different from his position. The Baltimore Orioles' uh, interests were they wanted to pay him a fair price, but they didn't want to pay him a lot more than his statistics were meriting at the time because in comparison to other players, it would be too much. But what, what happened was as they got into the discussions, they realized that Cal Ripken's real interests were he wanted to be able to sell his uh, goods in the stands because he and his wife liked to support a lot of charities. He wanted to assure uh, first-class hotel accommodations for him and his guests, which, of course, cost money. And he wanted what everybody in every organization all over the world always wants, parking. He wanted uh, to be guaranteed parking uh, access to the stadium. And so the Orioles were able, and he were able to come together around these kinds of interests and bridge the gap that their positional bargaining uh, was creating. 
So that's the difference between interests and positions. Let me ask if there are any questions about this point. Good. Let's move then to the second principle of effective negotiations, which is to protect the relationship. Now, the first principle here is to be respectful of the people. And you say, um, you guys in Washington don't know much. That seems pretty obvious. Uh, let me go to the um, uh, bankruptcy court in Lexington, Grace Dupre and others. Uh, what, how can you be either respectful or disrespectful to people when you're negotiating? Um, don't interrupt them. Um, give them eye contact and that kind of stuff would be respectful. I think the listen, I'm, oh yeah, use a calm speaking voice and polite tone. And All right. All very good ideas about respecting people. Uh, let me uh, ask in uh, the bankruptcy court in Los Angeles, any additional ideas about respecting or disrespecting? Don't attack them personally. Which we saw on the video, it's a real bad idea to attack people personally in a negotiation or in communicating in general. It really uh, deteriorate, that makes things deteriorate very quickly. Um, by the way, uh, one of the things that you might do if you're, if you're being attacked uh, personally is not reciprocate. Uh, there's been some research done on the power of non-reciprocal behavior. I don't mean reciprocity, which is what we talked about before, but I mean reciprocating behavior. In other words, if somebody attacks you personally, to not come back and also attack them personally, but to try to take things in a different direction can really help a negotiation. Um, it's fascinating, uh, if you think about it, uh, during the 1988 the presidential debates, uh, George Bush was seen on national television going like this. I don't know how many of you remember it, but I remember it very vividly. And um, you're wondering, uh, what was George thinking? Why was he in front of millions of people on national television? Why would he look at his watch? So they asked him. They said, George, what were you thinking? And he said, well, what I was thinking was that I was debating a very loquacious individual named Bill Clinton who likes to talk, and I wanted to be sure he was staying in his 90-second limit. Well, that's good about what George was thinking, but the question is, what was his audience thinking? So uh, be, being respectful of people you, you have to be conscious of how you're looking to the other person, not only what you're doing yourself, as a very important point there. Let's take a look at some other points uh, under this rubric of protecting the relationship. You want to be sure you listen and understand their point of view. Now, being heard and also to be unconditionally constructive. Let me back up for a minute to the, be, to the listening and being understood or heard. Uh, one of the most powerful human motivators is being heard. Uh, when people come out of ADR proceedings uh, and they, they're asked alternative dispute resolution in the courts and they're asked what made this work for you, you know what they often say? They don't say I won or lost. They say I got a fair hearing. I was heard. So it's very important to be heard. People really like to be heard and that's a powerful technique. Now let's go to the next one about being unconditionally constructive. Uh, that means that whatever comes at you you come back positively. So like if somebody gets angry when you're negotiating, the advice is you try to stay calm, as you were all saying before. Um, let me ask uh, Bankruptcy Court, Maryland, Rebecca, how can you stay calm when somebody else gets angry? What can you do? Take a deep breath, um, count to 10. Just kind of be still before you speak. All right. Anybody else there have any techniques that have worked for them to diffuse anger or hostility? How about in Los Angeles? What do you do out there? Uh, how about bringing it back to the issue? Come back to the issue. Uh, you see it's getting a little off course. We're getting a little excited. Let's get back to the issue. Uh, you can say, um, Something like, I appreciate the passion of your position. And then we offer job counseling. Uh, or uh, you can say something that I have said to a very angry person one time. I said, you know, I respond much better to proposals than to threats. Now, Roger Fisher, who's the guru of negotiation, says when somebody gets angry at him, he imagines the anger going right past him and hitting the wall. And he comes back in a very low, 
uh, voice. And interesting techniques. It's not an easy issue, but uh, let's try. Sometimes it's good to say, I think, I think we need a break. This isn't going very well. I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. Uh, let's take a break. So those are all things that you can do to protect the relationship. Uh, and finally, uh, in terms of protecting the relationship, what you want to aim for is the idea of building a partnership around solving the problem. There's a lot of power in this if you can get to it. Uh, the two of us can really use our mutual talents. Instead of fighting with each other, let's use our synergy around the idea of solving a problem. Let's move to the next uh, principle of effective negotiation, which is, again, using good communication. And again, you say, well, that's pretty obvious. We're taught, you know, every course we ever went to uh, talks about using good communication, and I agree. But let me give you a few particular ways that I mean this. One, uh, be open to persuasion. Uh, you can uh, understand your interests, but you may not have thought of all, you the way, all the ways there are to reach your interests. For example, in a negotiation between an employee and a manager over the subject of telecommuting, a subject that I know is uh, very active in many uh, districts throughout the country. Um, the manager may uh, say, well, you know, I, and I actually I, I heard of a case where the manager said, you know, I'll tell you something. I'm against the idea in, in principle because of all these concerns I have, but I'll listen to your arguments to the employee who was proposing that he was uh, be able to do telecommuting. And the employee did a very smart thing. He approached the uh, situation not from his perspective, but from the boss's perspective. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. If you were to persuade a boss uh, for telecommuting, to do telecommuting, and you were doing it from your perspective, you would say things like, I don't want to sit in traffic. I want to be able to spend more time with my family. I want more uninterrupted time. And I want to be able to work at my own pace, whatever it is. These are all very legitimate and good reasons. But they may or may not be what's on the manager's mind. What's on the manager's mind are things like accountability, um, coverage, and equipment. What this employee did was he did research on those issues. How can I assure the manager of accountability? How can I assure the manager of coverage? And how can I get my own equipment or help the office with the equipment? And he did a lot of research, and he presented this information to the manager who who really didn't have as many ideas as the employee did about it. And she said, you know something, we're going to try this out because you've persuaded me that, I, that you can protect my interests, so I'm at least open to persuasion. The first thing is be open to persuasion, and that's very important. Have an open mind, as you were saying when we did our uh, little exercise. Second uh, point here, uh, demonstrate interest in the other person's point of view. Um, let me go to uh, Chicago. How can you demonstrate interest in somebody's point of view, Marva? This is Anita in Chicago. You would demonstrate interest by listening to the person and responding to what they are saying. Okay, by listening, by responding to what they're saying, perhaps by summarizing or paraphrasing, you can use a phrase like that's a very interesting idea, and you can deliver that sincerely. It doesn't mean I agree with it. It means I heard it. Again, there's a big difference between hearing an idea and agreeing with it. And at this stage of the negotiation, when you're just starting, it's more important that you at least hear the ideas. You don't necessarily have to agree with them. They're very good ideas. Let's go to our third point now on this, which is um, realize that you have partisan perceptions. Now, let me give you a little anecdote about this, which makes the point, I think, very vividly. Uh, there was a uh, young attorney right out of law school who went to a senior partner of a law firm and said, I'm ready for my first case. I'm really anxious to do my first case. I want to see if all this stuff I learned in law school uh, really works and is going to pay off. And the senior partner says, that's terrific. Um, here's your first case. I want you to work with the plaintiff. Go prepare the plaintiff's case. Come back to me when you're ready. So the young attorney goes out and very assiduously prepares the plaintiff's case, works on it constantly, doesn't eat, doesn't sleep, day and night on this case, comes back three days later. He says to the senior partner, I have the plaintiff's case down pat. I'm really excited. And the senior partner says, it's great that you have the plaintiff's case because you're actually working with the defendant. I just wanted you to understand the other side. You can't change somebody's mind unless you know where their mind is at. And you won't know where their mind is at 
unless you study their side as carefully as you study your own. Let me give you another anecdote in this regard. One of the authors of the major textbook, Getting to Yes, which I think is still the single best book on negotiating, it's a little penguin paperback. It'll cost you less than $10, and it's a great resource. Uh, William Murray went to uh, Brussels a few years ago and worked with the Russians and the Chechnyans uh, negotiating some parts of the peace treaty. They're having troubles again recently, but this was before the, the most recent episode. And they worked very hard concept on win-win you know, negotiating. They spent three, four days up there in Brussels, and they were negotiating and working at deals. And right before they left and they had a treaty, he gave them the following charge, which I think illustrates the point of partisan perceptions. Uri said to the Chechnyans, he said, what I want you to do before you leave is I want you to write the victory speech that the Russians are going to give when they get home about this treaty. And he said to the Chechnyans, or to the Russians rather, I want you to write the victory speech that the Chechnyans are going to give when they get home. Seeing it from the other side, seeing it from the other point of view is very powerful in negotiating. Let's make the last point on this slide now. Uh, uh, Covey says, Stephen Covey says, seek first to understand and then to be understood. Let me ask if there are any questions about using good communication. Okay, hearing no questions, we'll move on to our next point, a very important point in negotiations, which is to rely on legitimacy. Now, relying on legitimacy means when all else fails, you ask some very basic questions, such as, is the proposal fair, and is there an external standard or criterion we can use? Now, let me give you a few examples. Somebody says they want $200,000 for your home. That's a very interesting price. But can you tell me how'd you come to that price? How'd you arrive at it? What's it based on? What are other houses selling for in the market? I remember in the old personnel system, an employee saying to uh, his manager, I'd like a three-step increase in the courts. And the manager said, that's a very interesting idea. I heard it. Uh, can you tell me, is anybody else in the court system doing this? Is there any precedent? Is there any precedent? Is there any legitimacy? It's a very important part of the negotiation. I just saw a very interesting article about eBay, eBay.com, which some of you know is an online kind of auction uh, system. And they were saying what makes this work is that there's a tremendous level of trust among the people using it. Uh, some people <laughs> have apparently quit their full-time jobs to sell things all day and night on, on eBay, and they're making out pretty well. But one of the things that adds legitimacy to it is that there is a rating system that you as a uh, auctioneer or a buyer or a seller are given a rating. What's it like to deal with this person? You get a rating. Is it, is it pleasant? Is the person reliable, dependable? And that becomes uh, part of your, um, who you are, part of your identity. You get a rating by the other people in this uh, eBay about how easy it is to deal with you and how reliable you are. And that's a form of legitimacy. It's fascinating. Some people have actually called their friends and said, would you say some nice things about me, even though you haven't bought anything from me lately, just to inflate my rating on eBay? Kind of an interesting uh, situation. Uh, and the last point about legitimacy is that nobody wants to feel taken. Nobody wants to feel that they could have gotten a better deal, or nobody wants to feel that they uh, could have done a little bit better had they had more information or had the negotiation been a little slower, or whatever it was. Um, I remember one time trying to buy a tennis racket at a very nice hotel where you should never buy a tennis racket, but uh, being there and playing tennis and loving the racket and saying to the tennis pro afterwards, uh, would this racket be for sale by any chance? And uh, of course the uh, tennis pro said, well, you know, we could let it go uh, for about $180. Notice the phraseology, we could let it go for $180. And I tried to use some legitimacy. I said, well, tell me, how many times has this racket been used? And the pro said, well, it's been used once. And I said, well, you mean the time I just used it or a time before? Anyway, to make a long story short, I bought the racket for about $110, I think it was. Now, here's the kicker of the situation. 
it took me about four months to get up the courage to, tr to check out the real price of that racket because I did not want to feel taken. And that brings us back to the point, nobody wants to feel taken, and that is another very important point about legitimacy. Now let me go to Chicago and ask, uh, is legitimacy a concept you can get a hold of? Does it sound helpful in terms of doing negotiations? Do you see any uses for it in the courts? I think you really want to be legitimate. It shows that you, your standards, you, you're setting high standards for what you're saying and the actions that you take. That's right. And the more research you can provide, the more you are going to be seen in that light. Uh, sometimes people wonder how they can persuade judges. And I think one of the very good ways to persuade judges is to know your subject. They're very bottom line people. They want the facts. They don't want a lot of fluff. And if you can buttress your arguments with legitimacy, with a lot of facts behind you, with a lot of comparative data, for example, what other courts are doing and so forth, you probably will have more chance uh, to influence people like judges or other high level uh, executives in the court system. Um, one of the uh, things that's uh, happening with, again, uh, using another computer situation with the internet is that uh, people uh, in occupations are easily able to obtain uh, information about what salaries are being paid to other people throughout the country in their same industry. And they're presenting this data to their managers. And it's becoming increasingly hard for managers to justify why a person is getting $10,000 less than the rest, of the, and the rest of the nation in the same industry. So again, the internet uh, makes access to information and information is power, in fact, in a negotiating environment. As somebody said earlier, it helps when people are willing to share information or to know some things about their subject. Let's uh, now just start in on uh, any more questions about legitimacy. If not, we're going to move to the next. I will make one additional comment in that sometimes it's hard to get agreement on the facts that we're talking about. For example, if you look at negotiations between uh, the Congressional Budget Office and the Office of Management and Budget in Washington, they have very different perceptions, for example, on the economic growth rate or on other things that you have to kind of project out. Sometimes it's very difficult to get agreement on what you might think would be legitimate data or objective information. So uh, that's uh, sometimes not as easy as it sounds but it's always worth trying for. Let's move to our next point uh, as we uh, move to uh, wrap up the first session. And this one is uh, the considering the options. Now what we mean here is we want you to consider a wide range of possibilities. We don't want you to uh, do what's often done, which is to fire hose ideas. Um, the uh, tendency we may have in our organizations is people will voice an idea and somebody else will say, well, we tried that before, or that'll never work here, or I know the boss won't agree with that, or forget it, there's no way. Uh, we, or we make facial expressions, we roll our eyes before the idea has even seen the light of day. That tends to limit ideas, it tends to limit discussions, it tends to limit, it tends to make people less willing to offer ideas because they feel they're gonna be shot down. And so we want you to try to avoid the tendency when you're negotiating to fire hose ideas, to take a fire hose and put an idea out before it's even seen the light of day. Rather, we want you to keep an open mind and explore a full range of options when you're negotiating. Now let's look at the next point, which is not to dismiss anyone too quickly, as we mentioned. And then thirdly, I would say, let's use creativity in solving problems. Now let me give you a few examples of creativity and uh, we'll probably this will be the last point we'll be able to make today because I want to talk about this one a little bit because I think there are some interesting ideas that have uh, developed around this idea of being creative. Let me first ask the audience, let me ask any of the sites, have you seen or yourself used any particularly creative approaches to negotiation?
Anybody in any of the sites? Let me give you a few examples of what I've seen in the way of creativity, and it may spur some ideas among you. One of the things that uh, happens often in a negotiation is that you might have people who are either very angry with each other or people who represent very different power uh, situations in a hierarchy. Uh, sometimes, for example, with judges and non-judges in the judiciary, when you're trying to have a collaboration or a negotiation, the non-judges tend to be very quiet. And uh, you get a lot more ideas from the judges than from the non-judges. And so because there are power discrepancies, it makes people a little shy and you don't get a full dialogue. I saw a very creative use of the technology. And in this case, again, it is a computer technology where I had um, a meeting run by uh, the AO, our sister agency. And I said, why don't we try, they're judges and non-judges. We want to get a full uh, plate of ideas, which we may not get in the normal course of things. Let's try something a little different. Let's uh, seat people at computer terminals. And let's have them type their ideas. And let's have those ideas flash across the screen unattributed. So that there's less chance that there's ego involvement in the ideas. And you know something? It really worked. We got a lot more ideas. Uh, and we didn't know who were they were from, and we didn't care who they were from. Uh, and we got a lot better dialogue and a lot better approaches uh, to a negotiation. So one idea is to use technology, uh, if you can, to facilitate a discussion or a conversation that's not happening uh, in regular ways. Another thing would be to search for different venues, again, for different places uh, to have a negotiation. Uh, the, uh, the, again, the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations uh, several years ago that ended up in the Oslo Accords were greatly facilitated by meetings of academics that were taking place in Oslo, Norway, uh, because the Norwegians have developed a whole style of negotiating. Uh, there was a, an exhibit actually in Union Station on Norway recently, and they had a whole section on the Norwegian approach to negotiations. They like to get people out of the public eye. They like to have no press involved. They like to take them away from the public eye put them directly with each other without a lot of formality, and they find that that really helps. And so these academics meeting in Oslo, Norway, were able to get some ideas into the traditional diplomatic process that was taking place in Madrid. And the Israelis and the Palestinians allowed that to happen, and they were able to move their negotiations forward that way. So we've got to be really open-minded to a lot of different ideas, a lot of different strategies in order to get negotiation creativity juices flowing. Let me go ahead and stop there uh, for today and ask you if there are any questions about what we've talked about today. Uh, we're going to head next week to continue to talk about these principles of effective negotiations. And then we're going to actually give you a chance to practice, to try it out, to negotiate a case study next week. But let me stop. We have a couple minutes left. And anybody who has any questions or comments, about today's uh, material. Mike, this is Harriet from uh, Los Angeles. Yes. Did you overpay for that racket? <laughs> Thank you. I forgot to tell you that I actually found out it was a $200 racket. So I did pretty well. But thanks for reminding me to finish the story. Any other questions? Well, again, if you think of questions during the week, you can always call me on the telephone or bring them with you next time. Um, I've really enjoyed working with you. I feel that we've had a good dialogue here, and I've heard some excellent ideas and uh, concepts about negotiating. Sound like you're getting into the material. And uh, we'll continue next week. I'd like to thank Heather and Tricia uh, here in our studio who make me look good and make us look good. I'd like to thank uh, Val Simmons for her work on this program. And I'd like to thank all of you for participating. You'll see some additional credits that'll come on the screen. Uh, have a good week, and we'll see you again on Wednesday. <laughs>